Welcome to Love Your Family Again and Again and Again and Again, the podcast where we focus on parenting with love and clarity. I'm Dr. Marcy, a family culture expert who for over 20 years has been helping parents to create happy and strong families. Today, I am with my oldest friend, Jess. I have known her since I was four years old. I have watched her family grow and I'm so excited to talk parenting with you, Jess. Hi. Hi, Mars. I'm very excited to talk parenting with you. So I know all about your family, but tell those who are listening who haven't had the joy of meeting your kids and having breakfast with them about your family. So my wife and I have two children. A is eight, and she loves everything unicorns and frozen right now. M is five and a half, and he loves dinosaurs and space. They were both within the last year diagnosed with autism level one. So that contributes to our parenting or is certainly a component of our parenting challenges. Thank you for sharing all of those pieces. Given that they like some very different things, what are, what's your favorite family activity? Well, right now, one of the things that we did um, this summer was we put a ball pit in our basement, and we really like to play kid soup. So that involves helping the kids jump into the ball pit and then stirring the soup with a pool noodle, and they think it's a really fun game. I'd imagine that a pool noodle is not really strong enough to move the children around the way I picture potatoes in a pot of soup. No, but when they hold on to the noodle and you kind of drag them through the balls, um, it does. That sounds fabulous. So the most important question I have is, can I come and be in the noodle soup? You can. Um, The balls are not rated for adult weights in terms of jumping, but you can lay in the balls and be in the soup. Okay. But I will not jump in to destroy the balls. While they jump. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you step on them, they'll feel like you'll feel like you're crushing them. (laughs) Okay, that wouldn't be fun. All right. So love it. Love the physicality of I can picture the kids in the soup squishing around. Yep. Now, I also imagine that you have moments where A and M are not getting along super well. Mm -hmm. And that creates some challenges, I'm sure. The challenge that I was going to talk about happens with both of them, but it happens more with A. Um, And it really comes down to me yelling and getting frustrated and impatient more than I would like. And I feel like I'm not my best parenting self. Very human of you. Well, yeah, um, it happens more than I would like. Um, And it feels bad for all of us. Um, And it's something that we've been working on and talking about to varying degrees, um, but we haven't really found a way to get out of this cycle uh, that works consistently. Okay. So you know I love a very human moment, a very human parent, and part of the solution is always understanding that you are going to be frustrated and have a hard time and that's that's par for the course of a parent. So the guilt that sometimes comes when we are not our best the best version of ourselves, the goal of letting that that go. However, I also love working through a specific scenario. So is there a moment that you can picture when something's going on that's really challenging in particular so we can get you some concrete tools not just around not yelling, but how to navigate that moment in time? with a little bit more ease and grace so that you have an alternative to yelling. Because anytime somebody says, just don't yell in that moment, I always get a little suspicious of like, well, that's nice in theory. And if I were reading a book, the character could do that. But in real life, it's never that easy. Yeah. The challenge, as I've been reflecting on this, thinking about um, our chat today, it comes up especially around um, having the kids, but especially A, having to meet expectations, um, like getting ready for school, turning off the iPad when asked, coming to the table for dinner, getting ready for bed. The kind of Those are all very common moments when this starts. We have tried a lot of solutions. Um, we have visual schedules for getting ready for school and for bedtime in the kids' bathroom. 
um, and we call them your jobs. Um, so we'll say, have you done all your bedtime jobs yet? Or something like that. We do a lot of previewing and warnings, like, you know, when it's time to turn off the iPad. We talk about plans ahead of time. So when we know, you know, bedtime's going to be earlier or later tonight, or we have a different plan in the morning on a weekend than we normally do, where we have to get dressed earlier, we'll talk, we'll try to preview that enough so that it's not a surprise when it's all of a sudden time to get dressed. We recently implemented a listening jar, which is a vase on the kitchen island with stones from a, from vases that if they listen the first time, they get a gem. Um, and I've even told them that when I ask them to do things and they don't answer or reply or do anything at all, which is what makes me frustrated, I feel like the adults in Charlie Brown, other than having to explain what that means and show them some Charlie Brown. They think it's really funny when I say, wah, 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 wah. And um, they're supposed to say, Mom, what's your message? After I say, wah, 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 wah. Um, and then comply. <laughs> we'll at least start to do what I'm asking them to do. That might be the favorite, my favorite tool that you have described so far. And when we think about parents doing everything, like you just named many, many different things that you have in place for it to be successful. But I'm guessing that sometimes it still goes off the rails because otherwise you wouldn't be yelling. Mm -hmm. So you have all these things in place, but what happens? Where does it fall apart? It falls apart when I still have to keep asking for whatever reminding that whatever the thing is that needs to be done, be done. Um, and with A specifically, if there's any hint of impatience or annoyance or frustration or anything at all in my voice, she immediately becomes very upset. She will sometimes cry. Um, she'll say, don't yell at me. Even when my tone of voice is calm and like I'm speaking in a two voice and I'm not yelling, um, but maybe I'm using a serious or a stern voice, she perceives that as yelling. Um, and then sometimes she'll say, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Or you didn't give me a chance. Um, even though I did give her a chance because this is like the second or third time I'm asking her to do whatever it is that I need her to do. So the, then we have a bad cycle where we sort of are reactive to one another. So she gets, frust she gets reactive and tearful or yells at me because she thinks I'm yelling at her. And then I become more impatient and frustrated and have a more yelling oriented tone of voice with her. And it just devolves. Yep. How often, let's think just the morning routine rather than all of the different scenarios. How often is this the way the morning goes versus A, sees the vis visual schedule, does her thing, gets it done, like, and it's a smooth morning? Um, I would say at least two days a week. Not every day, but enough that it uh, happens very regularly. Yeah. Which part of why that's important is it tells me that all of the tools you already have in place are working. Yeah. We just need to add something else mm -hmm. to help it go, right? Because sometimes it's it's looking at you have, you know, the visual schedules and the reminders and you do the timers. And sometimes we have to say, you know what? These aren't working. Let's take this out. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that we have to add, add in something else. My first question, because I know that with A, you've had some of these conversations, right? Like the Charlie Brown of them being able to say, mom, what's your message? My first question is, and I'm guessing you've done this, but let's just check. Have you done the check-in with her of, of, wait, am I really yelling? Let's think about what we just heard. Because that stop, pause, and reflect on, is she just being reactionary? Or did you really yell at her? And I'm sure sometimes each is true, but that pause might help her learn some emotional regulation in that moment. We have talked about it, but I have not asked that question. I will try it. And I think that what we have done is when she says, don't yell at me, we have said, I'm speaking to you in a very calm voice right now, and I'm not yelling. And she says, yes, you are. We have not asked her to do the reflection, but given her the answer that we have for that question. But maybe the pause to have her think about it would help. 
I'm hesitant though because her perception of what is loud voice and what is not um, that's like one area where I think some of her like sensory and social pragmatic challenges really surface so her perception of what is yelling and what is not yelling is not the same as my perception of what is yelling and what is not yelling (laughs) yes which brings me to the second part of this thought which is outside of these moments to create teaching moments and really sort of like in the same way we teach, you know, how to count and how to read and how to add, but doing a like, is this yelling? And having her answer, is this yelling? And have her answer, is this yelling? And kind of go through, especially with facial expressions and intonation of this is me being loud because I'm excited. This is me yelling because I'm frustrated. This is me being serious because it's important. And creating a social teaching moment of all of these different ways that we use our voice and use our volume and use our intonation to convey messages. Because especially thinking about her having a diagnosis of autism level one, we want to make sure that she's understanding that because her perception versus what you're doing, we know in these moments is not accurate. But my guess is other places in the world, it's also not accurate. It is, although she's done a lot of that kind of social skills training, and she knows the right answer, but she cannot apply it in the moment. So I bet if we had a conversation, I've talked to her about how yelling feels in your throat um, and how it, you know, you feel the vibrations in your throat more than when you're not yelling. She probably could do that like kind of intellectual exercise, but still perceive us as yelling or me as yelling in the moment when she's upset because she's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. Yes. So one more caveat, and then we're going to shift it into a different set of tools. I might practice this exercise in the bathroom with the sentences you use with her when she's not listening. Okay. Because if we're just, if we're sitting at the kitchen table, completely removed from all the things and using words like, is this yelling? Mm. She can follow that is what I'm hearing. Like you've done that, which is awesome. Yeah. But I wonder if in the bathroom, if you said, okay, listen, tell me what this is. And you said, Alice, brush your teeth. (laughs) She'd be like, that's yelling. And if you said, Alice, brush your teeth, she'd say that's yelling. But because you're then pairing those same things that she can do at the kitchen table to the language you use at the time in the space where you do it, it might be a little bit of the bridge that she needs Mm -hmm. to create the context with the concept. Yeah. Okay. So one possibility there. The second piece is to remember, now we're shifting into a different tool, is to remember that what she is saying feels true to her, but is not the truth. Yep. And so we don't have to go through and prove to her that it's not true. We have to stay focused on her brushing her teeth. Yeah. And so what is the language? What is the next step? What is the way to get her to follow the direction? Rather than to go on the tangent of, A, I'm not yelling, you need to brush your teeth, I gave you lots of chances, and all of that logical explanation that you want to do, that cognitive she can follow and emotionally you want to support. And could it be something like, after you brush your teeth, I'll give you a hug? Yeah. Right? So that we're going to make the repair. She knows that it's coming, but let's talk about that after you brush your teeth those type of pieces to keep her on track of doing the thing that needs to happen because you got to get out the door to school. Yeah, that was where the idea for the listening gems came from. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of what would also help because when I'm not yelling, I'm then making threats (laughs) or like saying like, this is going to be the consequence. And sometimes it's a consequence that she cares about. And sometimes it's a consequence that she doesn't really care about. Like being late for school used to be a consequence that she really cared about because she didn't want to be late for school. But she feels less strongly about that now than she did at this time last year. So now she's like, it's okay if I'm late. (laughs) Actually, (laughs) no. (laughs) No, no, it's not. But she doesn't care. And a lot of times that changes. Like what kids are invested in, which is part of why threats are hard, Because we're pulling them out of the air in our own moment of frustration. It's not a planned, intentional, organized way. And the truth is, especially with your kids. Yes. But with most kids, 
that doesn't work out super well because we get more frustrated. Our thinking gets less clear. We get more and more random things that we pull out, and sometimes we pull out a threat that we don't really mean. You know, I don't know if you've ever done it, but I've had families cancel birthday parties, cancel vacations, we're never getting ice cream again type of threats. And I'm like, back up! Then your kid doesn't believe you because you've made a threat that you're never going to follow through on. Yes. And... Well, she will ask about the nevers. <laughs> so, so, like, I'm going to take, I'll say, um, you know, if you don't turn off the iPad, I'm going to take it from you. And she said, forever? Smart. <laughs> take it away forever? No, I'm not going to take it away forever. I'm going to take it away for the rest of the day, though. And then do you? Sometimes, yeah. So I would say if you make the threat, then you have to make good on it. Yeah. Because. Mean what you say and say what you mean. I love the phrase. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's yours mm -hmm, for sure and your kids are so practical and logical mm -hmm. the more you follow through and mean what you say the more they know you're going to say what you mean next time mm -hmm. and that trust builds yeah so going back to the yelling piece if if we can come up with a way for you to remember to not actually yell mm -hmm. and say okay I know that A is sensitive to this, so I'm going to make sure I'm using an even tone, mm -hmm. that I'm just clear, that I stay focused on the action that needs to happen. Yeah. It's easier for you to not yell because when you're frustrated, you'll still hear this conversation in your head and you'll be like, okay, this is how I get to the goal that I want, which is to have her do all the things she needs to do in the morning. Yeah. Which then makes it easier for her not to feel like she's being yelled at because there's a consistency in how you show up and have that conversation. Yeah. It's like we want to make a routine out of these moments where either you are actually yelling or she simply feels like you are yelling at her. Mm -hmm. If we make it into a routine, it's going to be easier for her to do it. Yes. Right? Kind of with that ease and grace. So one of those things is to remember that you do not have to argue with your kids. Yeah. Not easy in the moment. But so when she says, mom, you're yelling at me, you defending yourself is not necessary. Mm -hmm. finding the language, whether you did yell or not, of just checking in and saying, oh, yeah, let me let me tone that back or being like, no, I didn't. That was not yelling. But saying, we're going to talk about that as soon as you brush your teeth, my love, so that you stay focused on the action at hand. And if she learns that none of that conversation is going to deter the teeth brushing from being the thing you are reminded of, she might still feel like she's yelled at, but she's not going to go down that conversation. Because part of it is that she doesn't want to be brushing her teeth. It's not even necessarily that she doesn't want to be brushing her teeth. She's just so distractible. She just forgets. And, you know, she's totally fine with doing all of the jobs. She's not resistant to doing them. But being reminded to do them is extremely uncomfortable for her. So I wonder how we get her more comfortable being reminded. Mm-hmm. Because just like all of us, when we're off base, it sometimes comes with this yucky feeling of someone else is pointing out my flaw. Yes, that is absolutely how she responds. Her solution, because I've asked her what she thinks the solution is, is that we don't give reminders at all. That's not realistic. So a compromise we've reached, yeah, a compromise we've reached for the morning anyway, is that we will not give any reminders until 7.30. We have to leave for school at 8.15, 8.20. She's always up at 6. So if she eats her breakfast and gets dressed and brushes her teeth and goes to the bathroom and does all of those things before 7.30 without us, have, we won't ask about them at all until 7.30. That helps sometimes. I love that. We used to do that more when we first made the schedule. And then like as the schedule has become part of the wall, um, it, we've done that less. But we could go back to that. Okay. What if the reminder is not about the specific task, but about checking the visual schedule? Would that feel better? Probably. Like if you said to her, hey, A, 7.30, let's go look at your visual schedule and see what you've done and see what's left to be done. Yeah. Would that feel different than go brush your teeth? Yeah. Yes. Tools only work if we use them. And that might feel really different because then that also can be a we're going to celebrate what you've done as well as acknowledge what you haven't. Yeah. And that can feel really different than go brush your teeth. 
The other side, just more in general and not necessarily in the morning is, do you create moments where either you talk about things you forgot, talk about things where your beloved reminded you to do something or model that? We do try to sort of uh, model some of those, you know, forgetfulness moments or distractible moments or um, making mistakes, um, all of which are upsetting to her. So that helps too. So I might, you know, for the next four weeks, decide that you're going to plan to to focus on reminders so that you and your love say, okay, each day I'm going to remind you of something and you're going to have forgotten it and it's going to be fine and vice versa. So that there are two examples where she's seeing two people who care and love about each other saying, oh, hey, did you pick up strawberries. Oh my gosh. I forgot strawberries when I was at the grocery store. We have apples. Can we have some apples as our snack and I'll get us strawberries tomorrow? Yeah, sure. That's great. You know, we forget sometimes and it'll feel weird because it will be this very, in some ways, performative, but very explicit conversation about forgetting things and needing to be reminded. But the goal is to, is to show a, that it's okay to forget. Or like, hey, did you, you know, fold up the blanket from the couch? No, let me go do that right now. Oh my gosh, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Insignificant things. But then you name like, I forgot to do that. I will go do it now. So that just like brushing her teeth, when you say to her, hey, did you brush your teeth this morning yet? Rather than saying, stop reminding me. She has that language that you have about other things of, oh, I forgot. I'll go do it right now. Yep. And if you create that in her environment on a daily basis, hopefully she will pick it up and realize it's not a big deal, right? That modeling can be really powerful. Um, and I also think of, of kids on the spectrum needing a specific script sometimes for the social language to, to match up with what's happening. My final thought around it, and I love that you asked her what will help her do it in the mornings so that she has been part of the conversation, but also talking to her, to her in this very explicit way of we all forget and it's okay, but not in the moment. Like this is dinner conversation or bedtime conversation. And so building up some of the emotional intelligence, and I know that this is work that she does at school all the time. I know this is work that you guys are on doing in an ongoing way but talking to her about how it feels when she gets reminded and that it's okay. Like it's okay for it to feel yucky and do it anyway. It's okay to wish you remembered and do it anyway. It's okay to be embarrassed and do it anyway, right? This idea that we can feel the hard things or do the hard things that we don't want to do yes, helps our kids be resilient. And I think that if that's a piece of the conversation of it can feel yucky and do it, mm -hmm. that that changes it. Because sometimes when we have these big moments of feelings, it de it stops us from doing the thing. And so to kind of the, it can feel yucky and. And A, definitely gets stuck in the yuckiness. And that's part of what she's learning. That's part of how she's needing to very specifically be taught about the world so that she can be more flexible. But I wonder if in other moments you talk to her about it feeling hard and doing it anyway, if in the moments when she's feeling really inflexible, if that reminder of like, it can feel, I can feel inflexible and do it. That might be a longer lesson than a quicker lesson for her. <laughs> yes. But the, I cannot like being reminded and go brush my teeth, that that would be a, a thing to think about how to navigate and add that into for her. So that it's not always that you have to make the repair before she takes the action. Sounds good. Awesome. So we've talked about a bunch of different ways to go about this. So my curiosity is, what is the one thing, if you're like, okay, the one thing I'm going to remember and go put in place, because I know as a busy parent, if, if you have too many things, nothing gets done. So what's the one takeaway that you're like, today, we're going to start? Well, I like the idea of talking about what is yelling, <laughs> what is not. Um, but I also think um, 
having the the piece I think that we haven't done that would be useful is having that outside conversation about what being reminded about things feels like for her and not and having that conversation not in the moment you know just having a conversation about how being reminded is something that we all need sometimes and starting to do some of that modeling or giving examples of when one of us and parents have needed modeling have needed reminders I mean and that it's not a criticism and it doesn't mean that she's a bad kid or whatever it is that she's hearing under the surface in the message and and finding out what is the message that she hears. Yep. I love this. I think that's an awesome takeaway. And you guys have such thoughtful conversations that I'll be curious to hear what happens when you have this one. Mm -hmm. I will update you. Excellent. All right, Jess, it has been so fun having you here and chatting with you about your family and A, and I appreciate you being open and vulnerable about your own frustration and yelling and less than graceful moments because it's sometimes hard for us to admit those things too. So thanks for being here and chatting. You're welcome. You're very welcome. It was lovely to be here. Yay. All right. And thank you for listening. I know your time is precious and limited, so I'm grateful that you shared it with me and Jess today. And I'm curious, what is your one action takeaway step? Share it with me in the comments on my website at drmarcy.com. Want to be the first to know when new episodes come out? Go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast and sign up for my mailing list. Want to be a guest on a future podcast of Love Your Family again and again and again and again? Go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast guest and let me know. Finally, Do you need individualized help for your family? Do you want to have a private session with me or someone from my team virtually or in your home? Then visit drmarcy.com backslash contact and reach out. Remember, blue skies are ahead and we're going to get there together.